Tonight, rising tensions at a most holy time. Israel launches retaliatory strikes into Gaza and Lebanon. We don't want to escalate with Hezbollah at this point. We're focused on Hamas. Militants kill three people in two separate attacks. Reaction in a polarized U.S. after accusations of a political firing on racial lines. Yesterday, it looked like a Jim Crow era trial. The saving grace of faith for a family that went from Syria to Ukraine and back again. It's a little bit sad, and in the same time, like we're in peace. Now, a first Easter in Canada. This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. Tonight, Israel and the West Bank are on edge after another deadly day. One person was killed and at least five more injured after a car rammed through a popular promenade. It happened in Tel Aviv. The victims are reportedly tourists. Police shot the driver dead. The suspect, an Arab-Israeli, according to the Israeli security forces. The country's foreign ministry is calling it a terrorist attack. That wasn't the only violence in the region today, all of it after rockets lit up the sky last night. Susan Ormiston now with those details. Israeli rockets left their brutal mark Friday in Gaza after a night of bombing the most severe since last August. A Palestinian taxi driver found his car buried his sisters inside their home, narrowly escaped, he says. We thank God that he saved my parents and siblings from death. There was no warning, he said. The nighttime rockets aimed at Gaza and parts of southern Lebanon were a clear signal from Israel that it would not stand by after dozens of rockets were launched against Israel from inside southern Lebanon on Thursday, the worst attack since the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. In response, the Israeli Defense Force said they struck Hamas targets, concealing weapons near a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. This man's home was hit. We woke up and the roof started to fall on us, he said. After days of escalating tension, Israel says it does not want to draw Hezbollah into a wider fight. It blames the Palestinian militant group Hamas. It's a multi-dimensional threat, but it's a one organization or one enemy here. And we were focused on an enemy. We don't want to escalate with Hezbollah at this point. And we were focused on Hamas. But tensions remain high. Two Israeli sisters in their 20s were killed and their mother critically injured Friday in the occupied West Bank. <laughs> A vehicle arrived at the intersection, blocked their movement and shot them at short range, he says. Troops are searching for the shooter. The IDF is calling up military reservists as Israel's prime minister warns that its enemies will pay for acts of aggression, says Benjamin Netanyahu, and should not take advantage of domestic political infighting. Jerusalem is tense, at the crossroads this weekend of three religious holidays, Easter, Passover and Ramadan. At the Al-Aqsa Mosque, after the violent clashes midweek, Friday prayers were mostly peaceful, but the holy city is still on edge bracing for violence, but invoking calm. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. The Wall Street Journal reporter arrested by Russian authorities last week has now been charged with espionage. In the Russian system, charges mark the beginning of what could be a lengthy criminal probe. Evan Gershkovich has entered a formal denial. He's the first U.S. journalist to be detained in Russia on spying allegations since the Cold War. Two more people have been killed in the aftermath of that powerful ice storm that tore through parts of Quebec and Ontario. And as Kate McKenna shows us, hundreds of thousands of people are still without electricity. After two days in the cold and dark, some coffee, a shower, and a quick phone charge. It was a very pleasant morning, much better than uh, sitting around in a cold house. Residents of Chelsea, Quebec, say they're thankful for this warming station, one of more than a dozen set up in Quebec. Last night I had to get out my three-season sleeping bag. It felt like winter camping in the house. But 
More than 1,400 hydro employees have been dispatched, painstakingly restoring power throughout the province. Parts of Montreal are still a mess of tree branches and downed wires. There's no question we, we're living with, uh, with a crisis. Quebec's energy minister says power for 80% of customers should be restored tonight across the province. We're dealing with the vegetation control, so we're dealing with trees, so it's difficult to prevent that from happening unless we cut all the trees. In Ottawa, crews are also cleaning up. Most homes have power again. It's a lot of very small pockets where they're without power because trees have fallen into the hydro wires. Authorities confirmed the second and third deaths. A 75-year-old man died of carbon monoxide poisoning. A 59-year-old man in eastern Ontario was struck by a branch. I'm asking Quebecers to help each other. So I'm going right now to see my mother after a small visit in St. Anne and uh, bring them some hot meals and hot coffee. So it's important. It's cold for April. That call for kindness on full display at the warming centre in Chelsea. We're all in the same situation. So just, just saying to your neighbour, uh, you know, are you okay? And uh, the, the, the residents, some families also came. And yesterday we could, ha we could hear, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of uh, kids having fun and playing together. Kate, it's of course a long weekend and lots of people will want to cook their holiday meals. Is there hope though for those who are still in the dark? Asha, authorities say about 95% of all storm-related outages should be resolved by tomorrow night. That is good news for people who are cooking Easter dinner. But until that happens, people are asked to stay away from downed wires, uh, from tree branches that are on the ground, and not to use their generator indoors. That's because authorities say it's better to be overly cautious than to take any unnecessary risks. Sound advice. Thanks, Kate. Hundreds of people rallied in downtown Winnipeg tonight calling for justice for Linda Beardy, an Indigenous woman whose body was found in a Winnipeg landfill earlier this week. I bargained with humanity to not touch my family, but here we are. Justice for Linda Beardy. <laughs> Beardy was 33 years old, a mother of four and a member of Lake St. Martin First Nation. Police say they do not suspect foul play, but her family is calling for an independent investigation into her death. They say they've lost trust in Winnipeg police, in part because of how it released information to the public. Karen Pauls has the story. It's more than a shock. Lucy Beardy is exhausted and in mourning, but she's also angry. I felt like I was ambushed, like I was set up for, for this. Beardy is talking about this news conference on Thursday afternoon. She says she didn't give the Winnipeg police permission to reveal details of her sister Linda's last hours alive. I told you guys clearly I needed to consult my family. Police say Linda was seen leaving this store alone on Monday morning, and they've seen security footage that shows her getting into a nearby garbage bin. And she was actually observed to climb into the bin on her own. Now, there was some activity observed within the bin, and after a short period of time, there was no further activity observed. But she was not observed climbing out of the bin at any time. The contents were later picked up and dumped at this landfill where city staff found Linda's body. Police have ruled out homicide. There were no other injuries that suggest any kind of foul play. Police have not yet responded to Beardy's criticism, but she says she's lost confidence in them. What we, well, what I'm asking for and hoping for is an independent investigation, uh, just that would be more thorough and also that we can trust. She also plans to file a complaint with Manitoba's Law Enforcement Review Agency. But first, she and her family are gathering to remember a life lost. She was like all her nieces and nephews' favorite auntie. She was smart and strong. Beardy saw her sister in a Winnipeg mall just last week. Linda asked her to message her son and tell him she loves him. 
and that she's been really thinking of her babies and trying to get on a better path. That path now cut short. Beardy's only consolation is the last thing she said to her sister. My last words to her were, I love you. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Across the U.S., eyes are focused on Tennessee, where Republicans voted to permanently oust two Democrats for loudly protesting on the chamber floor. Both of the lawmakers are young black men. And as Magda Gabrasalase shows us, the issue their expulsion raises is not going away. Welcome to Tennessee, where there's a pattern of racism. After the expulsion of two black lawmakers, Tennessee's Black Caucus pushed back today calling out the actions of the Republican-led chamber. Yesterday, it looked like a Jim Crow era trial where we saw two black men fighting for their careers, fighting for their reputations. It all started with a protest calling for gun controls. Demonstrators flooded the state's capital after a school shooting in Nashville that claimed six lives. Three Democrats joined in with chants on the House floor. Representatives Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, and Gloria Johnson. No action. No action. Accused of breaking rules around decorum, the two Justins were voted out. We will never quit. We will never quit. President Biden called what happened to them shocking and undemocratic. Former President Barack Obama said no elected officials should lose their job simply for raising their voice, especially when they're doing it on behalf of our children. And Vice President Kamala Harris flew to Nashville to meet with the expelled lawmakers today. Johnson, the lawmaker spared by one vote, says it's pretty clear why she was saved. I'm a six-year-old white woman, and they are two young black men. But Republicans say it's about upholding the chamber's rules. Call it peaceful, you can call it whatever, but they had a protest against House policy on the floor. Our members literally didn't look at the ethnicity of the members that were up for expulsion. Johnson isn't buying that. They felt like young black men don't have the right to sit in the chamber with them. They don't see us as equal. Local bodies are working out what to do with Jones and Pearson seats ahead of special elections. If they win those elections, they can't be kicked out twice for the same offense. Mark de Gebra Salasa, CBC News, Washington. Cold weather caused Pope Francis to skip an outdoor Good Friday ceremony tonight. The 86-year-old was scheduled to attend the Way of the Cross procession at the Coliseum, but that was called off with nighttime temperatures hovering around 10 degrees. <laughs> Earlier in the day, Francis led a service inside St. Peter's Basilica. The Pope was treated in hospital last week for bronchitis. Now, Easter has a special meaning this year for one recently arrived family of faith in Calgary. They've lived most of the past decade back and forth between two war-torn countries, Ukraine and Syria. Aaron Collins has their story. It's often the little things, the familiar things, that provide comfort in turbulent times. But for this family, change is everywhere this Good Friday. They're first in Canada. What's the adjustment been like to life here? Oh, first Easter, you know, uh, out of our country, it's a little bit like uh, sad. And, and in the same time, like we're in peace. Their path here, anything but peaceful. Anastasia's family from the Donbass region of Ukraine, still occupied by Russian troops. Her husband, Elias, from Syria, embroiled in a conflict of its own. Your family has been trapped between two wars for over yeah. a decade. Yeah. What is that like? It's very difficult. When I remember it, I just feel like... Uh, Oh my God, how we, we stay alive, because if I will count you the, that situation we were in the middle, you will not believe how we overcome this or how we survive. Alive and adjusting to a new life in Canada, the one constant for this family, their faith. God, he, he replied for our prayers, 
and now we feel so safe and um, we are for our kids a very good future here. A belief that has brought them to this church, this congregation praying for peace. I hope that war will finish soon. I think that people in Russia, they really don't realize what is happening. But even here, in a holy place, on a holy day, thoughts of conflict linger. Still, this day is a return to the familiar, a day for faith and for family, finally safe in a new home. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. 35,000 unionized workers at the Canada Revenue Agency will be in a position to take strike action one week from now. The bargaining unit finished voting today to authorize that, just weeks ahead of this year's May 1st deadline for filing tax returns. The union is seeking wage increases, more flexibility for remote work, and improved job security. They've been without a contract for about a year and a half. Tonight, there is growing skepticism around the Ontario government's proposed changes to rules for renters and landlords, especially for those who are forced out by renovation plans. Critics say tenants aren't getting enough protection. Philip Lee Shannock takes us through it. It can be very competitive trying to find an affordable place to rent in Canada's biggest city. On the ground. This tenant says she feels guilty for scooping up a one bedroom in a rent-controlled building. And I inadvertently sort of stole an apartment from someone because um, I, I stopped in at the office and the, the rule at the rental office is whoever gets the forms in first gets the place. But she knows she could lose it just as quickly. People who are, are given a notice that the apartment is going to be renovated and they have to leave and then they walk by six months later and nothing is happening or it's been rented to someone new. Provincial rules already state that tenants should have the option to move back without a substantial increase in rent. But disputes over so-called renovictions are up dramatically. In Toronto, home to half of Ontario's tenants, the latest figures show that cases before the Provincial Landlord and Tenant Board have grown by nearly 300 percent. And the cases can take years to be heard. Tenants at this Toronto high-rise were told they could move back in after renovations. Three years later, they're still waiting. The province says it's toughening up rules on renovations and promises penalties if landlords are found in violation. In order to speed up cases like this, Ontario is spending millions of dollars to add 40 new adjudicators to the Landlord and Tenant Board. That's about double what they have now. But will it help renters? Tenants advocates say 90% of applications before the board are actually landlords looking for evictions. They're just hiring more adjudicators to throw people into the streets faster. Doesn't help tenants at all. It makes it worse for them, actually. He says the provincial and federal government should encourage construction of rental apartments. Philip Lee Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. Here's a troubling metric. Compared to other developed nations, Canada's infant mortality ranking is slipping from top 10 to the bottom third. Yvette Bren takes a closer look as to why. 15-month-old Ava Bell is helping her parents find light after a dark time. Ava was born um, almost a year to the day of uh, Beau's passing. Jennifer and Mario Bazina's firstborn, Bo Paul, died of sudden infant death syndrome when he was just three months old. And I just, I could not, like, accept that he was gone. It just, your whole world falls apart. Researchers say thousands of infants under the age of one die in Canada every year. It's heartbreaking, and it's been heartbreak on repeat. Since the 1980s, Canada's infant mortality ranking has slipped from the top 10 of developed nations to almost the bottom. There's an average of 4.4 deaths for every 1,000 births in Canada, and it's more than double that among Indigenous people here. I think it is not clear to the public and for us as a country that we uh, rank so badly. Dr. Andrew Buzari says Canada needs to do more to help prevent infant deaths. It's no coincidence that the countries that are faring better on these measures, they spend more on health care in certain areas, especially in terms of access for maternal health, for mental health, and prenatal care and primary care. 
Low birth weight, infections and SIDS are among the leading causes of infant deaths in Canada. It's just not acceptable. I, I don't understand why. Jen Basna now works with other parents who've lost babies. I've been through it. And if there's any way to prevent um, an infant death, I, I think all of our efforts should be put towards that. No! She and her husband are now hoping the story of their loss will help spark change. Yay. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. A Quebec Junior Hockey League is making a dramatic change to the game, banning fighting. It really does interfere with their ability to learn, their academics, and it influences their emotional state. Why not everyone agrees with the move? Next. How will ChatGPT change high schools? I presented the answers that ChatGPT gave to the students and I asked them to critique the answers. Why some teachers are trying to incorporate it into their classrooms. A newborn calf stranded in a freezing snowstorm. So we just popped in, uh, jumped in the snow bank and uh, pulled them out. It's life-saving rescue and the ride it hitched home. We're back in two. Some sad news from the entertainment world. S Club 7 member Paul Catamol has died. His family put out a statement confirming the death, saying the cause is unknown, but it's not suspicious. S Club was one of the biggest pop groups in the late 90s. They recently announced a reunion tour, but have not yet said if they plan to move forward. Paul Catamol was 46 years old. Former top Theranos executive Sonny Balwani is heading to prison after failing in his bid to remain free pending appeal. Balwani and his former boss and lover Elizabeth Holmes were convicted for the company's hoax blood testing technology, misleading patients and defrauding investors. The Quebec Major Junior Hockey League is about to make a major change. It's banning fighting in the game, saying it will lead to automatic expulsion starting next season. As Sarah Levitt explains, that's drawing mixed reaction. The Quebec Junior Hockey League was once legendary for its bench-clearing brawls, but now the league known as the Q is saying no more. Les bagarres sont interdites. Good news, according to Dean Bergeron. I have to prove him that I can, I can fight. Those were his thoughts as a 17-year-old. It would change the then junior hockey player's life. Immediately, he found himself over his head. I fell at first on the ice and I broke my neck. We heard a, a, a clack. Bergeron's spinal cord was severed. He would never walk again. Now, the league says anybody who fights will face punishment. The worry? The impact on the health of players aged anywhere between 16 and 20. This University of Ottawa lab studies head trauma. In hockey, trauma can happen in many ways. Fights, though, involve targeted hits to the head on vulnerable young adults. It really does interfere with their ability to learn, their academics, and it influences their emotional state. Things that teenage boys are not particularly good at to begin with. So when you add the uh, trauma to the picture, it becomes even more challenging. I'm not totally sold on it. As a former uh, hockey I, enforcer, I Riley Cote thinks fighting discourages players from cheap shots. There is a psychology around knowing that there's someone on the other side uh, on the other bench that um, can handle business, right? It keeps people in some bit in line. I still love the game. For Bergeron, fighting changed his life, but it didn't change his love of sport. Here comes Dean Bergeron. He went on to be a wheelchair racer, winning 10 Paralympic medals. Now he hopes hockey coaches across Canada are thinking. What are my duty? Is it to be sure that the cash gets in or is it the security? and the safety of my, of my little young players. Bergeron says to him, the answer is clear. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Canadians looking for a criminal pardon often face a long and complicated road, and some turn to specialized businesses for help. These services would not even exist if we had a process, a process where convictions expire. Coming up, a CBC News Radio Canada investigation looks at why some who have paid for help are still waiting for it. Courage in the face of a devastating diagnosis.
I'm not going to just sit on my butt and let it take over my life. I want to live a full life with or without Alzheimer's. The 84-year-old who's devoting his life to the fight. The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping our world. Getting a pardon to clear your criminal record is a long and complicated process. That's why many Canadians turn to companies to do it for them. But a CBC News Radio Canada investigation has revealed that not every company actually provides that service as promised. Sarah Levitt shows us what their customers have gone through. André Guimet and Rodrigue Trépanier have been together for more than four decades. Half an hour from the American border, the couple loved to take out their motorcycle and go for a ride, until one trip was cut short. Nice Sunday with uh, lots of sun, nice temperature. <laughs> and it, we said, we go in the United States take a passport and everything. And when I go to the border, she said no. In 1982, when Guimet was 22 years old, he was caught stealing a blender, a mixer, and some towels from a Zeller's store. He was charged with theft over $200. I do a mistake, I pay for that now. I can't go anywhere except in Canada. Guimet had to pay a $300 fine or spend 45 days in prison. He paid the fine, but 41 years later, he still has a record. To get a pardon, officially called a record suspension, you need to go through the Parole Board of Canada. Once granted, your record becomes private, removed from the Canadian Police Database. A complex process, people often turn to help via private sites or non-profits like the John Howard Society. A lot of people seek this because they want to be able to reintegrate back into society. Now that means that they want to be able to work. They want to be able to get a place of their own. They make you feel like you're a criminal. Okay? It's, that's, how the, that's the feeling that you have. When you Last year, Trépanier decided he wanted to get Guimet a pardon. Searching on Google, they stumbled on the company Canada Pardon Services. You thought it was an, uh, an official website? Yes, th that was an official website and they had some relation with the uh, government. It may look like a government site, but it's not. It's a private company. It offers to do all the steps required to get a pardon guaranteed. There is a place where you can apply, okay, so that's what I have done, I have applied. And uh, as soon as I clicked the enter, okay, the phone rang. Almost immediately, the conversation turned to money. To get a pardon, the couple paid Canada Pardon Services $1,096, then paid $167 for fingerprints. If you do the process on your own, the cost is just over $200. I was feeling confident, okay, to go with these guys until uh, the other things came up. Trépanier says after that first call, he felt like the company was ghosting him. In the end, he had to call them. What followed was a confusing email exchange that left the couple with more questions than answers and a feeling they were being ripped off. Radio-Canada's consumer affairs show La Facture called the company posing as clients. Donc, je peux demander pardon? Despite being presented with three cases that weren't eligible for pardons, company employees claimed they were. The owner, Hisham Shridi, didn't respond to our calls. He told La Facture that his company would only take on people who are eligible, and he blames the court system for delays in the process. Canada Pardon Services has already caught the attention of Quebec's Consumer Protection Office, which has received hundreds of complaints about the company in the past few years. In 2021, the company and its owner were fined almost $20,000 for not providing a written contract and not disclosing all the information required to get a pardon. Ethically, it's not correct. A lot of our clients are in this position and they are, are, they are already very vulnerable. So I definitely think that um, 
in one way, shape or form, they are taking advantage of these individuals. Guimet thinks so too. I said, me, I go practically in jail for $300. And her, his company, he stole me $1,200 and he's, he's, he's do nothing with that. So you feel like a victim almost? Yes, yes. These services would not even exist if we had a process that was a, a, a process where convictions expire. Independent Senator Kim Pate has proposed a bill that would make pardons automatic and free. If the record is more than 20 years old, Really? Is it relevant to whether someone poses a risk to public safety now? I would argue no. Guimet and Trépanier have decided to apply for the pardon themselves with the hopes a trip to the United States is possible soon. That's the CBC's Sarah Levitt in Montreal. The federal government says it is in favor of the idea of making pardons automatic, but only under certain circumstances. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendocino has said he hopes to have a law in place within two years. Alzheimer's disease is one of the scariest diagnoses anyone can get, but one Ontario man is fighting it with everything he's got. I'm not going to help live if Alzheimer's is going to get me, but I'm going to give it one hell of a run. How he's devoted his life to helping others, that's coming up next. About 750,000 people in Canada are living with a form of dementia, and that number is expected to triple by 2050. The disease can be debilitating, but Nick Purden recently introduced us to Ron Robert, a man who has found his own strategy to keep Alzheimer's at bay while educating others. When I was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's, all the doctors said basically was, I've got bad news for you. You have Alzheimer's and you've lost your driver's license. So there was no, what can I do about it? That was eight years ago, and ever since, Ron Robert has made it his mission to fight Alzheimer's and the stigma that goes with it. Us old people, well, for a lot of people in our society, we're now disposable. And that's how a lot of us of older people get to think after a while. But I'm not here to prove that we're not disposable, that we can still contribute. Today, Ron has brought his message to this nursing class at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. He has advice for them on dealing with people like himself. Take that five minutes to make that patient feel at home. Feel like they, the doctor wants to know your, sympathy, your, your, your symptoms. Now I'm here to follow Ron and see what I can learn, not just about what it's like to live with Alzheimer's, but from someone who spends every day trying to hold the disease back. Be there. I'm clapping for you. Hey. It's not about me. It's about you, all of you out there. You make me so cut and thick and proud. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. When I was diagnosed right away, I thought, okay, I know I've got it now. It's, it's certain. And it's a progressive disease. Right. I'm not going to just sit on my butt and let it take over my life. I want to live a full life with or without Alzheimer's. So Ron decided to do something he'd never done before. At 80, to challenge his brain, he went to university. And what I learned when I go to the library at King's University College with him is that Ron has made an impression. Oh, look at all these wonderful young people. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see all you guys. Give me a big hug. <laughs> uh, I just love being on campus with you guys. We love having you here. I've yeah. enjoyed it so much. You know. Have you? Oh, you guys have no idea how much you've helped me. Sometimes I'm walking around and I get lost. That's one of the symptoms I have for Alzheimer's. Is that my sense of direction has gotten all screwed up. My grandma uh, deals with Alzheimer's and dementia as oh, well. She? And um, just from personal experience, I know how um, difficult and overwhelming that can be. So it's truly inspiring, you know, oh, what you've been able good. to accomplish. When I first got diagnosed, not only did I want to help myself, but I wanted to help other people with Alzheimer's. 
he is not letting his illness overtake his life and instead he's inspiring others. I, uh, I've struggled with my mental health in the past and so I went into social work to break barriers myself and to show that uh, illnesses don't hold you back and to hear another story from a separate generation of, you know, you're not alone in this fight. It's certainly possible for us to do this. It took five years of hard work um, so and Ron graduated. Kind of he says so university he helped him. And there are studies that show that staying socially and mentally active as we age may lower the risk of cognitive decline. Ron plans to start up classes again in January. The other thing I learned spending time with Ron is how much he relies on his wife of 30 years, Catherine. In a way, she's become his short-term memory. What worries you about the future? When he doesn't recognize myself and his children. I, I know that that's one of the things that he has and he's living well, is that when he doesn't recognize me or his children, he would like to um, be able to, you know, get the needle and, and, and be, you know, taken care of. Until that day arrives, Ron says he'll be as active as he can be. He won't shy away from his Alzheimer's. In fact, the disease has brought him closer to an old friend of his, who he visits in a long-term care home. Keith Duncan, or Dunk as Ron knows him, has Alzheimer's as well. Oh, this is a nice little room. I don't remember this yeah, room. This is that yeah. So what kind of skin is this? Is that a rabbit? I don't know. It, it feels it's, like rabbit. It's but... funny you think that I know all this. Yeah, you did know all that. You've forgotten that all. But I've, you know, I yeah. I've forgotten. Do you remember we were here the other day? No, what the hell what were you doing here? No, we were just sitting here talking. You say we were talking now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So many times we get yeah, tangled, exactly. tangled up and do, don't know what we're doing or what it, we're well, seeing. Well, you and I have the same symptoms because you, you have no short memory and I have no short memory. Tell me what it means that Ron comes to visit you here. We're all buddies. That just, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Because if we weren't buddies, we wouldn't be sitting in one damn room talking. What's it like to live with Alzheimer's? Uh, don't. Don't live because it's kind of puzzling. For you, in your own life, whatever you do, you don't know exactly whether to turn right or left or ball or anything. Does it scare you, the disease? No, no, because it's me. It's in me. I can't help it. I don't even think about it. No, I don't, I don't know about it because I don't think about it. Ah, oh, that was a good visit. I enjoyed that visit. He did really well. Yeah? Yeah, he did. Super, because usually he does not talk to people. What does it do for you to, to come here? It's good for both of us. He feels good, I feel good, and I think that's what it's all about. And I recognize him as a person and not as an Alzheimer's person, but strictly as a person. I feel like it's almost like a responsibility when I get up in the morning. I, I've got a day ahead of me. I have to do something with that day. That day's a gift. And that's every day of my life. I'm not going to outlive Alzheimer's. It's going to get me. But I'm going to give it one hell of a run. Nick Purden, CBC News, London, Ontario. Good night. Since we first brought you that story, Ron has continued doing speaking engagements in his hometown of London, Ontario. He's also now enrolled in postgraduate studies at King's University College, where he gets this, plans to get a master's degree. What an inspiration. Meantime, many worry about how artificial intelligence could affect education. Coming up, we'll look at how programs like ChatGPT are already changing high school classrooms. Plus. Oh, you like the scratches, eh? You like the scratches. How this newborn calf ended up in the backseat of this man's car. One snowy morning in our moment.
take a close gander at this picture, specifically the planter. Inside, there's a mother goose. Nearby, on patrol, her mate. And the pair aren't exactly friendly to passers-by. The reason, inside that planter, there's a nest filled with eggs. All of this in front of a mall in London, Ontario. A pretty busy location, which may seem off, but experts say open spaces are appealing to geese because it allows them to spot any advancing predators. Since its arrival last year, ChatGPT has disrupted education. The artificial intelligence technology is capable of producing university-level essays. Now it's come to some high schools. And as Deanna Sumanak johnson explains, that's got educators debating. High school math teacher Jamie Mitchell says there's no point fearing ChatGPT, even though it can be used to do anything from writing an essay to solving a complex equation. He's found a way to use it in his course. I asked ChatGPT a whole bunch of different uh, problems that the class was also solving at the same time. Um, I presented the answers that ChatGPT gave uh, to the students and I asked them to critique the answers. Across Canada, views on ChatGPT in public schools vary broadly from one school board to another and from one teacher to another. Here in the Halton District, it's not banned on school-owned devices, but just next door in Hamilton, it is. In a statement, the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board said, we are monitoring the use of ChatGPT as it relates to the education sector. Many times, This author and educational expert schools, wants it banned in elementary so school. Because once it gets out into the world for these young children, once they realize the power of it, it's going to reduce the, their motivation to learn. Because why? All I have to do is go type it up and ask a question. And for teachers who need help spotting work that's been done by ChatGPT, this young Canadian at Princeton might have the answer. A ChatGPT detector called GPT-0. So one of the things it looks for is bursiness in writing. So you can think of this as um, for a machine writing, it's, uh, it's pretty constant and consistent over time. But when humans write, um, maybe it's because of our short-term memory and creativity. There's sudden bursts and variations in writing style. Tian is actually against banning Chad GPT in schools, but he says AI is here to stay. And we have to figure out how to make it a part of learning while maintaining education's focus on critical thinking and creativity. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. This calf was just hours old when this picture was taken, but it had already been through an ordeal that almost cost it its life. On his way to work, Ryan Steele noticed the calf stuck in the snow, freezing cold and alone, but not for long. He loaded the calf in his car and set off to find its home. Tonight, it makes our moment. Well, we were just driving to Nipah for work and uh, we seen this calf was on the highway. So we just popped in, uh, jumped in the snowbank and uh, pulled him out and threw him in the back of the car and we just started driving around to try and find the, the owners. By himself, covered in snow, stuck in the ditch. He was kind of scared, but he was also cold and he was starting to get weak. So he needed to be back with his mom to get, uh, to get the nutrients he needed because he, he was only born that night. <laughs> What a morning. I've always been an animal lover and I have a lot of farmer friends and rancher friends. So I just, I know how much yeah. these little ones mean to them. So I just, I just always happy to help. We were already late for work. So <laughs> a couple of extra minutes didn't really matter. Oh, you like the scratches, eh? He likes the scratches. Oh yeah, they really look like they like the scratches. They drove around actually, Ryan, for 15 minutes before finding the farm in question. The calf was reunited with its mom. It's doing well, by the way. Ryan is actually going back to visit the calf Easter Monday. What a reunion that will be. That is The National for April 7th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Have a great night.